Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Chargers Analytics with Arjun. And we are here to discuss the team that is the Los Angeles Chargers. You know, like, I'll start off by saying this. I was on vacation with my family, you know, uh, so just spending some time with them. Um, we booked, like, a, a thing that we were going to do on vacation the day uh, uh, on Sunday, basically. So I missed the entire day of football only got to catch, you know, Sunday night football. And I wasn't like too worried. Like I knew we, we had some COVID issues and all that. I was like, okay, we're playing the Texans. Like, okay, we'll get back, whether we cover the spread or, you know, regardless of what happens, we're going to win this game. Right. And I get back, go on my phone, check the score and we lost. And I was like, wait, we lost to the Texans. Justin Herbert threw for 300 yards. He didn't get hurt. And then I see the Texans scored 41 points. Okay, they, you know, Herbert threw a pick six. The Texans offense scored 34 points on us, on this defense. And, you know, it it really, really made me question my priors. It really made me reevaluate the team. That's why I had to take, you know, a day and a half to like just process what happened. I mean, this is, the Texans are not a good football team. This might like the Texans might legitimately be the worst team in the NFL when healthy. And like, even if Brandon Cooks was playing, they still, in my opinion, would have like the worst offense in the NFL. The fact that they played that well against the Chargers just blows my mind. And, you know, like, I'm going to do a T- Tom Telesco review and like draft review and like how the Chargers should build a roster in the offseason. But Man, like the fact that we were playing guys like Asang Bassi and Devontae Harris and and like, you know, Derwin was out. So we we're playing, um, you know, Lohi, but then we had to play Trey Marshall. And it's like the, the defensive line gave up 140 yards to Rex Burkhead. I'm just I'm so confused on what happened and how it was allowed to happen. So basically, you know what needs to happen for the Chargers to make the playoffs. If you guys don't know already, they have to win out. Like if they don't win out, they're obviously not going to make the playoffs. 10 and seven is borderline not making the playoffs, right? We should have been going 11 and six and be a shoe in for the wild card spot. But instead we blow it. You know, the team decides not to get vaccinated. We have three guys as I'm recording this that we know aren't vaccinated. Mike Williams, uh, Chris Harris, and uh, Nasir Adderley that went on the COVID list, they could still play, but the fact that, you know, they don't, you know, they're not vaccinated regardless of what their opinions are, it really does hurt the team because now, you know, we're in a really important divisional game with huge, huge playoff implications against a team that kind of blew us out the first time we played them. So let's just, like, let me just go through some of the things for the Texans. I mean, like they average 0.109 EPA per rush. To put it in perspective, like averaging a 0.1 EPA per pass is pretty solid. So the fact that the Texans averaged a 0.1 EPA per rush over the course of an entire football game is baffling to me. Okay. Like it's, I understand we were missing Justin Jones and all that, but that, that is no excuse. I mean, like I said, this Texans offense was missing Brand, was missing Brandon Cooks and three offensive line starters. They had five rushes for over 10 plus yards five they forced five missed tackles on rush plays they forced nine missed tackles overall like i i'm just like how did this happen to this defense and like i said i am someone who accepts my wrongs i i accept when i was wrong um in the past before the season when i said brandon Sealy would have a good defense regardless of the players he knows how to adjust his scheme his scheme works And here's where I went wrong. I still believe the scheme works. The scheme in itself, the way it's built, the conceptual idea and the mastery behind it, it's all directed in the right way. He wants to limit explosive passes and force you to run the ball. Where I was wrong was that this team is built for that scheme, which it isn't. And even when the starters are healthy, this team is not good defensively that doesn't mean Brandon Staley is a bad coach let's not get that wrong Brandon Staley is a great head coach he should be the the coach for the Chargers for a while because he gives the Chargers a chance to win in the margins that other coaches don't which is going for it on fourth down being aggressive 
throwing the ball in early downs. Like if we look at the, the Bengals, like the Bengals have a really solid roster that's kind of held back by Zach Taylor because they don't throw the ball on early downs a lot. I don't know why. Maybe it's because they want to protect Joe Burrow, have him taking less sacks, less dropbacks and all that. Brandon Staley gives the Chargers a great chance to win by his game management and his aggressive mentality. Now, with that being said, this defense, and excuse my French, is fucking awful. This defense is terrible. Like, the fact that, like I said, the Texans dropping 30-plus on this defense, I don't care who was out for us, is is just unexcusable. It, it really is. Davis Mills had five explosive passes of 15-plus of yards. Five. And we forced three total pressures. So if Joey Bosa and Justin Jones are out and we're going against a team with three backup offensive linemen and we only get three pressures, we have issues, my friends. We have major, major issues. And let's not get it twisted. Let's not get this twisted. The Chargers did not lose this game because of their offense. I don't know who said, or if anyone's been saying, because I've kind of stayed off Twitter since that game for a little bit. I don't know if anyone's saying that the Chargers offense lost in that game. The Chargers offense scored 29 points. They scored on every single drive besides, you know, the turn, the, the drives that had turnovers, which was three of them. They just weren't good on third downs, which forced them to kick three field goals. The Chargers had a 64.3 success rate. 64.3. This means on a per down basis, the Chargers were successful in, gen, in getting a play that is considered a success. So what that means is on first and 10, they got at least four yards. On second and 10, they got at least three yards or they got at least to like second and three or they, no, no, sorry. On first down, they got at least four yards because it's first, first and 10. On second down, they got at least um, half the distance to the first down marker. So if it was like second and eight, they got, they made it at least third and four or better. For second and 18, they made a third or nine and better. That's a second down success. A third down success is converting a first down, same thing a fourth down. So that is 64.3 success rate on offense. Unfortunately, this trash ass defense without Bosa, Derwin, Michael Davis allowed the Texans to just dominate. And that's what lost them the game. Not this offense, not Joe Lombardi. It was the defense. And what I'm so scared and like what I just don't understand, the Chargers have one of the best offenses in the league. We can all agree. Justin Herbert's a top five quarterback. All right. He's a, he's a great quarterback. The problem is the Chargers, my friends, have become the new Chiefs. The Chiefs from weeks one through six are what the Chargers are now from weeks 10 to 16. What that means is the Chargers, as you saw on the graph before, if you want to rewind and go look at that, the Chargers were second in the amount of first downs uh, converted on a new series. But now the Chargers are, so they're second on offense in converting first downs. They're second to last in allowing first downs to happen on a, near, on a new series on defense right? So this defense is not good. It's awful. In fact, not only are they last or second to last, they're kind of tied with the Jets and the Falcons, the Jets and the Falcons. Let me get that straight. We have a defense with Joey Bosa, Derwin James, Michael Davis, Asante Samuel, Justin Jones, Kaiser White, and we're tied in a defensive statistic kind that kind of measures their efficiency. We're tied with the Falcons and the Jets for last. And like I said, I was wrong about Staley. I don't, I don't think I'm wrong about his scheme. I was wrong in the way that I thought he would, he would use the scheme to bring out the best in his players because right now it, it's just not working. And I, I really don't know what it is. And, you know, the last thing I'm going to do, by the way, go follow my guys, uh, Timo Riske, PFF underscore Moo on Twitter and PF, or at Kevin Cole PFF, who I use, you know, some of their numbers for. If we look at, you know, the, the playoff picture and like what we kind of want to happen, um, I can't, you know, this is kind of small for people seeing it on YouTube, but basically, you know, if we need to, we have a 41% chance to increase our playoff probability if we win this game against the Broncos. What else do we need to happen? Well, as uh, on top of us winning out, we need the Dolphins and the Ravens to lose. Luckily, they both have pretty tough matchups, right? The Ravens play the Rams. So if the Rams win, our playoff probability increases by 17%. If the Titans win, our playoff probability also increases by 17%. We also need the Colts to win because that increases our probability by 8%. So basically, here's our guide to, you know, who do we want to root for on top of the Chargers on this Sunday? We need the Colts to beat the Raiders. 
I hope Carson Wentz comes back. Even then, I, I still think Jonathan Taylor runs all over them. We need the Titans to beat the Dolphins, which, I mean, like, look, the Miami Dolphins are, are a Mickey Mouse team. I mean, they have not beaten anyone outside of the Ravens. And the fact that they've gone from one and seven to eight and seven, I mean, props to them for pulling off seven straight victories, but it hasn't been against anyone impressive. And then we need the Rams to beat the Ravens. The Rams offense has not been playing like really, really well. They've been hit by COVID, but the Ravens have been decimated by injuries. I don't see anyone on that defense covering Cooper Cup and Odell Beckham and Van Jefferson. I'm hoping, you know, things fall our way because we we really need it after how we screwed up against um against the Texans. So now let's get into some stuff about the Broncos. Let's start with this. Um, so as you can see here on the screen, we're looking at the Chargers offensive EPA per play progression throughout the course of the season. Remember EPA stands for um, expected points added and it is one of the best uh, ways to measure offensive efficiency. Um, ignore the labels here. I, I don't know why I got messed up, but basically you know, we're looking at how the Chargers offense has performed over the course of the year, right? It's had its best games versus the Chiefs, the Browns, uh, the Eagles, the Steelers, and the Giants. And like I said, this past weekend against the Texans, they were up right above the 75th percentile in terms of how good they were on a per play basis using EPA. And we're not here to talk about the Texans anymore. Uh, let's, if we look at the Broncos, the Broncos forced the Chargers to have a below a 25 percentile offensive game, right? So, you know, Vic Fangio has done wonders against the Chargers, whether it was Phillip Rivers or Dustin Herbert, he's been able to slow them down. Um, realistically, if our offense doesn't score more than 27 points, we don't win this game. In fact, seven out of our eight wins have come when our offense has scored more than 27 points because our defense just can't stop a nosebleed. Because if we go to this next graph that I'll show on my screen, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that this Chargers defense has, has not, well, this is, there we go. Hold on, it's not showing up on my screen. If we look here, you'll see that this Chargers offense has tumbled off a cliff, off a cliff. And let's not get it twisted. This Bengals game is inflated. I, I you know, I can't EPA. That's one of the, you know, things about EPA. You can't really like, you can weight it differently, but I kind of just wanted to use the, the raw EPA uh, per play great uh, metric. This this Bengals score, which is right above negative 0.3, right in that negative 0.35-ish area, it's that low slash high, depending on how you view the graph. It's that it's where it is because of the Tavon Campbell fumble six. Without that, this is not a good defense performance. Remember, the Bengals almost came back 24-0. They almost did. So, you know, realistically, the Chargers defense since the Eagles game has had Let's count this one, two, three, four, five, six games, six games below the 25th percentile in, in terms of their defensive performances. It's just been going down a cliff. There's been no sign that they're going to turn it around. So, you know, when, when we talk about, oh, the Chargers are not a team you want to face in the playoffs. At this point, the Chargers are a team that if your offense needs to have a get, get right game or a bounce back game, you want to play the Chargers. And you know, I hate to see it. Like Brandon Seeley has not done a good job with this defense. I don't know if he's overwhelmed with, you know, dealing with calling the plays and game planning and all that. There just hasn't been a good defensive performance in a while. They didn't perform well against the Broncos the last time they played, right? And, you know, at, at the end of the day, you, you just got to, you, you just got to wonder if, if they're going to be able to turn, turn it around the last couple of games. I do have faith in Staley that he'll be able to make personnel adjustments and all that when you know the offseason arrives. And we'll get to all of that when when that happens. But you we're really gonna need a good defensive performance. And it's coming against the Drew Locke led Broncos. I, I tweeted about this actually this morning on um or was it Monday morning? Well, I, it was it was, I think it was Monday morning. It was like the the Chargers opened in the betting markets um as as six point favorites against the Broncos. And they opened as six point favorites, even though they got blown out by the Broncos at home, right? Or they got blown out by the Broncos a couple of weeks ago or in week 11 on the road. And they just lost to the Texans. So the fact that they opened as six point favorites, despite all our COVID issues, 
kind of shows what the market thinks of Drew Locke in that he's not a good quarterback. So like if Drew Locke somehow throws for like 250, two touchdowns, three touchdowns on us, I am I am not going to be as, um, I wouldn't say like cordial. I'm not going to be as like sympathetic or empathetic towards Staley as I am right now because he's had to deal with a lot of injuries, but so has almost every other team. And, you know, this defense has not been playing well. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show before I wrap it up today. So I wanted to introduce you guys to something that I created. Um, maybe I should have shown this at the beginning when everyone else is watching, but if you made it this far, thank you. Um, I, I created a way to measure um, how much help a team has um, has given their quarterback. So, and I, I made this graph using that help metric. And it, this is combined with my friend, Tage Seth. You know, he's been on the show before. I've combined that with his own like QB metric to measure like efficiency, which takes in the EPA per play, PFF grade and all that. Um, my help score, as you can see on the, on the X axis, is taking into account special teams EPA, defensive EPA, rushing EPA, um, ESPN's pass block win rate, and then um, how open every receiver is when targeted for the Chargers and for um, like every other team. So as you can see, the, Justin Herbert has the third best um, QB performance composite score. So like this is measuring efficiency. This is Tage's score. He's at the third best score behind Rodgers and Kyler Murray, which is amazing. And, you know, it's, I don't know if it's a good thing that he, he's in the not a lot of help quadrant. Like, ideally, you kind of want to see him in the has a lot of help quadrant. But if you guys are dealing with some Burrow versus Herbert takes on Twitter, just, just go to my Twitter and, and, and show and like copy link to this graph that shows like Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow almost have are pretty much neck and neck with us having the same amount of help. But Justin Herbert is just the superior quarterback uh, per my friend Tage's composite score. Again, I'm not going to go too much into the PFF grade and, and how they have Burrow as the number one quarterback. I'm just going to leave that. But pay, pretty much, Joe Burrow has also played the, one of the easiest passing schedules in the NFL. So obviously, if he's not performing, he's not a good quarterback. But the fact that he's performing, it's good. But he hasn't faced as hard of a schedule as the Chargers have, who have faced the hardest strength of schedule per PFF's you know, strength of schedule metric. So guys, that's going to wrap it up. Um, you know, I, I don't think we talked a lot about the Broncos, but we we already know what the Broncos are. They're a team that wants to run the ball. Drew Lock is, you know, if we let Drew Lock beat us through the air, we're going to have some issues. Their defense is going to be good. You know, Fangio plays the same style of defense as Staley does, except, you know, he likes to, I think he can mix it up more. They have a little more versatility because of how much talent they have on that back end. Um, if we don't get Mike Williams back, it, I think there will be some issues throwing the ball because, you know, Keenan Allen's production has dipped a little bit the past couple of weeks. Patrick Sertan is a really good cornerback, even though he's he's still a rookie. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a complete offensive performance. I'm going to the game on Sunday. So if you see me, you know, make sure to shout me out, uh, you know, give me a wave or something. I'll, I'll make sure to hit you guys back up. But yeah, that, that's going to wrap it up for today's video. And with that, as always, bolt up.